بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد As a continual, as a part of the continuum in our series about revert stories, I thought it would be useful, and I've been thinking about this for some time, to mention the story of one of our beloved Ali Compton Clark, Rahmatullah Ali Rahmatin Wasiya. And unfortunately, he's not here to tell his own story. And I do believe that he would not mind if I shared some of what I know and perhaps some of the experiences that we shared as his story deserves to be told. And I believe <clears throat> from what I've seen, because he was a beloved brother, originally from LA, from Compton, California, uh, had been involved in gangs, the Crips to be uh, specific, I think they call them the Rolling Sixties, is the set that he was a part of, and his story, and what what I will probably more appropriately appropriately title this as Reflections on Ali Clark. Because as again, he's not here to tell his story. And I can only recall blips in pieces. And I know that the brother Muta Bil has also mentioned some background and some the experiences that he shared with Ali because Ali was quite a beloved figure and honestly alhamdulillah from the brothers of Ahl Sunnah that I know and have been close to he was a genuine beloved brother who respected all people and was one of those types of individuals who others respected and loved. I don't know anyone who disliked this beautiful brother. And we ask that Allah Jal forgives him and blesses him with Jannah Fardos. I knew Ali to be a man of upright character, a man of sound intellect, a brother who had been through so much, you know, he'd been, lived a life in the streets. And he had spent his time in prison. And I remember him telling me some of his war stories. And one story that I can remember is he told me once that I don't know what, I, I don't know if this kind of was something that kind of led him to Islam because I don't believe he was a Muslim at this time, obviously. But he said once that it was sort of like the cartoon character for those who are familiar with uh, Bugs Bunny. That what happened to him, <clears throat> there was some sort of event. I don't know if it was a Karamakam Allah, if it was, you know, because of drugs or what have you. But basically he was telling me about one of his near, uh, near death stories. And he said that the individuals involved that the shotgun, they shot at him. And this was just one of those amazing stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored him and pointed him in the direction on his journey to Islam. And what he told me is that it was like the cartoon, kind of like the Bugs Bunny cartoons, that when they shoot, how it goes and it 
everything the the especially with a shotgun all the pellets all the the from the shells that it it peppers and it went around like his silhouette and he told me that that's what happened to him and that 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 was uh you know some one of those amazing stories that happened in his life that was one of those events that shook him to the core and and led him on his journey to islam I don't recall if he said that he accepted Islam in prison or it was after. But I know that his journey was a steep and eventful journey. So I will just talk a little bit about what I remember and where we first met. So I first met Ali, Rahmatullah Ali, Rahmatin Wasiya in Yemen and I had traveled to Yemen I had a one-way ticket I could read and write a very little bit of Arabic but I I didn't know much but I could I could you know because I could read Quran and I learned in the masjid in my local one of the local masajid in Seattle Washington or perhaps it was SeaTac I don't recall and anyhow I came to Yemen, I had some directions, you know, about where to go to Sheikh Mukbil's camp, Allah Yarhamahu. And so I didn't know, I just had a blank piece of paper and I didn't know Arabic and I was supposed to go to a masjid, which is a famous masjid in Sana'a called Jam al Khair, called Masjid al Khair. And it's a very famous Salafi masjid and it's still there, Shari, Shari Taiz. And it has a lot of history, and especially for Muslims from everywhere, from the West, from the East, wherever, because it was, back in those days, was one of the main Salafi centers there in Sana'a, in the capital in, in, uh, in Yemen. So, I remember after arriving in Yemen, and the next morning I got up, you know, I heard the Adhan, I was so excited, and because a lot of the uh, Masajid there in Sana'a, were Zaydiyya Shia. So they, what they do, one of the things, the bid'ahs that they have, is they do the adhan and they say certain words like Hayala khair al-amal or something like this. You know, come to good deeds. Hasten to good deeds. They added this to the adhan. But I remember being so excited. And when I prayed Fajr, and made it to the masjid. You know, I was confused because, you know, I'm coming from America. And, you know, there's, you know, I got up really early. The, the first Adhan was very early, you know, and I was just so excited. But I remember, anyhow, when I went to the masjid that was close to my hotel, you know, and just the character of Yemen. And anyhow, I met some Westerners in there. You know, they could see, obviously, I was from the West. The clothes I was wearing, I was wearing maybe an Azar, I think, and a Pakistani Penta Pajama which is like a, a a top that you wear so it's just a mitch match that you wouldn't see you know the Yemenis don't dress like that really the way I was dressed so I met some brothers from the UK and anyhow they had come across I believe Ali and Hassan Somali so anyhow I'm not sure if they pointed me in the direction to where I met within another day or two uh, I met Ali and Hassan a Somali, one of the du'at, uh, he's in, he's from the UK and he's in uh, Philadelphia, he's well known for his da'wah. And they were together. So when I met them and they told me how to get to Jam al Khair, but you know, they were kind of hanging out in Sana'a, I don't know exactly what they were doing. Maybe Hassan was getting ready to go back to the UK, Ali was there, but I think he was probably trying to work or something, maybe he... Uh, you know, what have you. But we hit it off immediately. And so moving on after some time, I think I I went to Damaj for a while, then I came back. We met up again because there was a whole crew of Westerners, Americans and, and Brits who lived in Sana'a and other places. So we all, you know, would kind of know each other, knew each other, especially if they were Salafi, if they were in those circles. And even the ones that weren't Salafi, there wasn't that many in Yemen. 
So you would eventually meet everyone who was there somehow one way or another at that time. And so Ali and myself, we became close. You know, mashallah, he had memorized something of the Quran. And I remember he was, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, just doing a little bit of Talib al-Ilm. He had done some Talib al-Ilm and he was actually going to give me a, a daras, I think, in some classes in Nahu or something, in, in, in Arabic grammar, you know, because I was really just learning Arabic a little bit beyond the beginner's stage. You know, I mean, I could read and write. So, you know, I was doing the Medina books, maybe the first book. Um, and... I remember Ali, he was just a, a genuine character. So we, one of the things I, I can recall, recall, we both, uh, you know, had gotten married and uh, to, you know, women there that were probably from the same tribes and so forth. And when Ali, he came to my home, okay? And so I remember, and those old stories so we we would be in there literally for hours drinking tea laughing like two children you know cackling like hens you know because that was the kind of guy he was he was a really uh he was just real genuine and we could relate you know especially both of him from the west coast him from la i'm from seattle but you know there's a west coast flavor and he would give me his war stories and i would just tell him my background and we you know we would just really have a good good time but he was a genuine uh, warrior and I could tell some other things that are a little more personal that he may not want me to share. So, but he was a warrior, no doubt, you know, and, and we had some adventures there in Sana'a where it could have gotten out of control, but alhamdulillah, he, he was patient and I tried to encourage him to be patient because I didn't want him to hurt someone. <laughs> so anyhow, we had some good times together and a story which was uh, maybe of something of interest that happened to us, you know, and so this will be a part of our documented history. Hopefully one day I'll be able to write some of these things. As I remember once, it was a Jumu'ah and Jam al-Khair, Masjid al-Khair, because that was a Salafi Masjid. At that time in Yemen, there was a lot of hostility between the groups, you know, Akhwana Muslimin, you know, Jamaat al-Islah, and there was also, of course, a lot of communists, you know, Yemeni communists and socialists, very strong and they hated Sheikh Mukbil. In fact, when I went to Aden and I stayed in the masjid there, I think the day I missed Sheikh Mukbil by one day, he had come from to do Dawa and do a, he went to a masjid called Masjid Rahman or Masjid Rahman, I think it was, in Aden, in a, 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 a township in Aden or a province or area called uh, Mansura. Anyway, they tried to kill him. They, I, I left the masjid the day before, I think. And the Sheikh came, gave some lectures, and they killed one of his bodyguards. I think they tried to throw a grenade and it killed his bodyguard. Alhamdulillah didn't kill the Sheikh. So they tried to take his life many times. So the Dawah there, especially in those days, you know, Yemen is still a place of a lot of weaponry, uh, Kalashnikovs everywhere, and even, <laughs> you know, grenades. You could buy a grenade if you wanted. You could buy probably a RPG, you know, all kind of bazookas. I have seen people who all kind of high weaponry. That was the kind of place it was. And so this particular incident, we were in Jamal Khair, it was Yom Jumwa, and there was, you know, there was a particular place where a lot of the foreigners did, you know, so, you know, it was a Salafi masjid. I mean, you know, there, and, and you know, it's different. Yemen is a, Yemen, a Muslim country, of course. And when you have a Salafi masjid like that, Jamal Khair was very big. Uh, you know, man, you probably how you know had about a thousand people. Even I lived in that masjid for a while. You know, students, you could just come from wherever you were in the world, and you could literally just have a sleeping bag and pull up a place, put your baggage, store your baggage, and you could sleep sleep in the masjid. You know, that's how it was back in those days. So probably many of us had spent some time sleeping in some of those uh, places of the Sunnah. So can't remember if I was living in there at the time I may or may not have been I lived there only a short time I think uh, and anyhow 
where the Westerners used to congregate and a lot of other foreigners like Somalis and Ethiopians, perhaps some Indonesians and and others, uh, was near, after Jumwa, we would kind of get together and, and, and especially the American, the Westerners, America and Britain, and maybe there might be a few Germans or, you know, a couple other people, French scattered in there. So we would, uh, we would meet and it, brothers would just kind of naturally congregate by the, in front of the bathrooms. Okay. And anyhow, I remember I was in the masjid. There was another brother, Abu Zainab. He was there. Ali Compton, he was there. Uh, there was another guy who went off the hook named Amin, a white brother from America. And there was, you know, some other brothers from the UK, Hamza and Rashad, going way back, you know. And anyhow, uh, subhanAllah, I was talking to uh, a Somali brother, Talib al-Ilm, and I was asking him, hey, you need to teach me some Arabic or, you know, I mean, he was speaking to me in Arabic, but, you know, you know, help me advance my Arabic, you know, some courses or something. And anyhow, I remember all of a sudden, boom, I heard an explosion. You know, it was just crazy, you know, and so it was, somebody had had made a bomb in like a can or something. They put a bunch of nails and things in there, and it was just such a weird event, but I remember one of the first things I, you know, we, we heard this noise because we were in the masjid, and then there was a bunch of people outside, and so I remember running outside the doors, and the first thing I saw, Abu Zainab, for people who know Abu Zainab, he's got a long history in Yemen. You know, you could hardly go to Yemen and you didn't know Abu Zainab, especially from America and, and from the West. Uh, he, I think he's in Saudi Arabia now. He's very ill. But he lived in Yemen for quite some time, probably 15, 20 years. And, uh, but the first thing I saw, because he was, he's always been, probably since he was a child, paralyzed from the waist down. I see his crutches and it reminded me like the cartoons again. I'm not a Bugs Bunny fan, but but it was just like, you know, when they have the bomb and everything disappears, it's just a puff of smoke, and then you see, so I was like, oh my gosh, my man, you know, I see his crutches laying on the floor, but alhamdulillah, someone had pulled him away, and I think he got hit by some shrapnel, you know, there might have been some blood there, and Ali also was hit, Ali Compton e. Clark, so this is history made, not many people might know, I think he had shrapnel in his neck a little bit. And Amin was hit because they were in the hospital. They were taken to the hospital. But alhamdulillah, they're, I don't think they ever got the shrapnel. That was what Ali told me. And, uh, you know, basically we carried some bodies. You know, me and I remember Hamza and Rashad, the two British. We were like some of the most active people because it was very strange. And I guess it was the politics and kind of the oppression going on in Yemen at the time that, you know, a lot of the Yemenis were like hands off. Even the Imam, that really kind of shocked me and kind of disappointed me. You know, they were just sitting there like, oh, it's another day at the office like this. And we're kind of like panicking. I, I, and I had that thobe forever as a memory, but it was blood soaked because I carried a few Yemenis. We put their bodies in the truck. Uh, they died later. They weren't dead on the scene. But I remember looking at uh, a guy and I don't remember if Ali what exactly you know but i remember going to visit him in the hospital as well because you know after that we're like you know what's going on da, 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 da. And, but he was he was okay he just he had a little bit of shrapnel i think in his neck and it never got out just a little bit and so it blew a hole in the wall i remember it blew a you know a significant hole not so big maybe like this in a, a concrete wall and eventually three yemenis died and i remember carrying this guy thinking you know wow you know, he's probably not going to make it because his, I think it was his chest or something, you know, and you could see metal, you could see shrapnel. And so I'm sure he was one of the ones that died, but we just loaded them in the pickup truck. And it was only me and those British brothers that were like, I, I was like, it was just weird. The Yemenis were just kind of standing around. It was, it was the strangest thing. And I'll never forget that. So that's one of those stories, I guess, worth mentioning. Uh... What else? I don't mean to get away from Ali, you know, but after that, after some time, you know, we spent in Yemen, we both left Yemen at the same time. Uh, I didn't have much money and he didn't have much money, 
But for some reason, we went to the Emirates. We were, you know, I was debating to come to Saudi Arabia. I had never been to Saudi Arabia. I'd never made Umrah. And I was like, I had a little bit of money. And I was like, well, I don't want to spend all my money like that. But, and I want to study in an Islamic university. And for some reason, someone had said you could do that in the UAE. <laughs> Instead of me coming to Saudi Arabia, and it wasn't meant for me, obviously, to come and try to get in the Islamic University of Medina or, you know, in Umu Qura, which, so it, obviously, Qadr Allah Ma Shafa'ala was not my destiny. So I went to the UAE, me and Ali, we both did, and uh, we, had, we had some crazy fun stories, even in Sana'a. Here's a story. Once, I remember, because his Arabic was much better, he'd been living there, his Quran was much better. He was, he was, he was uh, a genuine, beautiful, beautiful brother, Ali Compton E. Clark. We used to call him Nestor Douglas. And if Bilal, I'm gonna send this to uh, my man uh, Abu Bilal in the in Sweden, because we were all real close. And so we used to call Ali Nestor Douglas because his chest, Ali was all chest. He was, you know, from the from the, from those days, growing up, you know, lifting weights, and you know, off he's coming out of out of prison and stuff like that. You know, he had the big chest. So me and him, that was a long-standing joke. We'd always we did it for years up until you know, till his death, you know, every time I'd call him or he'd call me and we'd say, oh, the birds, I saw some birds migrating to Medina. You must be in Medina now. And, you know, so we'd always joke and start laughing. I say, yeah, because the birds are looking for their home. They're looking for that nest to, to land on. So anyhow, uh, yeah, so I remember that Ali, what was my point? So this was a story from being in the sana, you know, and uh, like I said, Ali, he had, uh, you know, his Arabic uh, was much further advanced than mine, and uh, so once I remember, because we were, before, we, we, you know, we we're talking about leaving Yemen, we're like, yeah, let's get out of Yemen, you know, I, I can't remember why, I, I didn't like Yemen the first time I went to Yemen, I actually, I hated living in Sana'a for a while, and it, you know, it was a lot of disappointments when you deal with some of the most ignorant people you could imagine, and this is not to take away from my brothers in Yemen, but it's just a difference between the North and the South, and then it was a lot of racism, and a lot of tribalism on a different level. You know, you run into racist incidents. I know some Brits who came there, one young Pakistani youngster who got in several fights. He was knocking out Yemenis all the time. So, you know, there was a lot of things that were uh, kind of disappointing and taking getting used to being in their country, but the corruption, because of the poverty, and so forth you would run into. So there was a lot of reasons why maybe we just wanted to get out of there, you know, and look for something better. And uh, instead of having the patience at that time. But anyhow, so <laughs> I remember uh, this one time, Ali and myself, we were, because uh, we had no money. We bo both really ran out of money. Ali this is one thing what we say, and this is not in a bad term for those who understand this in the American context, he was a hustler, meaning he could make things and get things done. You know, when he died, Allah Yarhamahu, he had three wives, I don't know how many kids, you know, and he was a supporter, you know, he was supporting his families, you know, so he was the kind of guy, he was going to work, he was going to make it done, and he was a very positive attitude, you know, he because he had been through so much, he had seen so many amazing things, and he gave me a lot of, uh, you know, when I was down, I was, you know, oh, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to have to go back to America, I'm going to do this, and da, da 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 and he, you know, he could pick you up, he could pick you up and say, man, quit tripping, uh, you need to do what it takes to make this work, so anyhow, we had no money, and, uh, you know, very little money, enough for a ticket to leave the country, and we're both newly married and, and stuff like this. And uh, we were going to, uh, so we, we're going around looking for uh, ways, you know, to see if we go to a charity. And I'll never forget this <laughs> because my Arabic was limited. So this time I was speaking. So we went to, uh, you know, some place, some sort of charitable organization. And the word, Nasr, as you we know, in Surah uh, Al-Nasr, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْ That, uh, you know, this is a means for help. So I tried to use that word and conjugate it 
and basically what I said, Ali, he cracked up. So we went, we went to this place and I tried to speak to them in Arabic and he, he had to clean it up after that. Because basically instead I was trying to say, we would like your help. But instead I was saying, we want to become Christian, you know, because Nasr, uh, the way I tried to con conjugate it was basically I was saying that we want to become Christian or something like this. And he, uh, you know, he had to clean it up and then he told me and we just cracked up as usual. That was one of our little, our, our little crazy stories. Then we went to the UAE. In the UAE, again, like I said, we had, I ran out of money very quick. And he was by my side the whole time. He was encouraging me, always positive. He, he didn't even have his degree. I had a, a, my bachelor's was almost finished. And he, uh, he didn't have a degree, but he already found a job. You know, he was a hustler. He made it work. He was not going back to America. He did. He was determined. He was a muhajir. He said, I'm not going back. I said, man, I, you know, I don't know. I can't get, a, you know, I was all stressed and a lot of drama. That's a whole nother story. But he was always there to encourage me and to, uh, and, and, and to, and to show me to, to man up and, and to, and to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was always encouraging to put the trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. So I remember he, he got something and I received some help. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me. Uh, we ended up meeting a, mashallah, Uzbeki brother who was a very good brother. I think it was from Uzbekistan or he was from Kazakhstan, I think. And he knew some wealthy Jamaat Tablik brothers. And uh, anyway, they helped me. They helped me stay there for a while. And then they eventually paid for me. They say, hey, you got to go. You know, and that, you know, you got to go, go back to America and restart because, you know, you can't just stay here. So they helped me when I, you know, I was down and out. I didn't have any, uh, ran out of money, had nothing and was in the struggle. But Ali, he stuck it out. And so later we met up again when I came to Saudi Arabia. I think he came after and... I was in Haal and he came and I think came to Riyadh. And so we, uh, you know, we'd lost contact, I think, for a while. And maybe we had distance contact. Sometimes he would come. Then I moved uh, after Haal. I was in Medina. And I think I'm pretty sure he visited me in Medina. And... Uh, he was living, I think, in Riyadh still for a long time. He lived in Riyadh. So he would come to visit me in Medina. And again, it would always be the same. We'd be in there cracking up like <laughs> like two chickens in there laughing and cracking up, talking about old war stories and just crazy stuff, you know. It's having a good time. Again, a genuine, righteous, beautiful brother. And we finally... Again, I moved to, after Medina, I moved to Jeddah after, uh, after moving around and stuff like this. I ended up in Jeddah. And I'm thinking that this is one of the last times that we saw each other. And he came to stay with me, stayed over the night, as usual, just, you know, just good man taking care of his stuff and handling business. We had an excellent time. I remember we broke our fast. He came, he had traveled and he was fasting. So it must have been Ramadan or something. And then we, uh, <laughs> I remember we went to this, uh, you know, like Chili's or some sort of restaurant like this. It was a, it was a, a, across the border or over the border. It was a Mexican restaurant. They had it in Jitta. So we broke our fast there. I'm sure he probably paid for it as usual. You know, he was just that kind of guy. He wouldn't, he'd rush to pay, he'd rush to just, just do good deeds. He was just like a genuine warrior from the street had been through so much and was a man of honor and integrity. So, uh, he stayed a night and then he hooked up with this other brother and, you know, probably went back to, uh, Riyadh. And so I think he was in Riyadh for a long time, you know, and so we had been in contact, you know, we saw each other rarely after that, but we, we were in contact. And so one of the, the last time I would have seen him, unfortunately, I went to Medina to a book fair with my family. And uh, he was uh, living in Medina at the time. And we were supposed to hook up. I didn't know he was uh, having any health issues. I didn't even know. I was unaware. He was that kind of guy. He also isn't going to tell you. He's going to keep his, his stuff 
to himself and he was the kind of guy yetahamal you know he would be he would carry that himself and carry that weight himself and so uh you know he didn't know he didn't tell me anything and i think i heard it from another another brother or something that he had had some health issues and i didn't know it was as serious so I went, uh, we were supposed to meet. I said, yeah, man, I'm coming. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the book fair and this and this and this. Let's meet at such and such time before I go back to uh, Jeddah. And so uh, we're supposed to meet. <clears throat> and then he said, oh, I'm, I'm at the hospital. I have a, you know, he wasn't, he was going to register in the hospital. And he made it seem like it wasn't a big deal. And my family was like, yeah, go see him, man. Just go see him. And I said, ah, khalas, I'll just catch him the next time. I said, you know, he said, yeah, man, don't, don't worry about it. We'll catch up the next time. I'm just in the, uh, I'm just in the line. Just kind of like a routine kind of thing or something like this. He was saying he was in the lobby. So I didn't know he had had, I think at that point, he may have had a stroke. So then when I found that out, I was just like, wow, Achi, you know what went in the world? So we were talking and. He was still like coming, trying to come up with business ideas. We we're talking about stuff we we're gonna do. Say, man, yeah, maybe we could do this to make some money. Maybe we could hustle, start a business, you know, this and that and the other. And uh, we spoke, we spoke several times, and then he told me that he had had, I don't know if it was a second stroke or whatever, because I didn't even know. And I was like, Ahi, what in the world? He said, man, you need to, you know, what's happening? Exercise and stuff. He said, yeah, I, I, I try to do that and stuff. But anyway. I think, you know, ultimately uh, stress and things like this, I believe, because, you know, again, like I said, he carried a lot of weight on him, a lot of responsibility. He was a hustler and he wasn't the kind of guy to ask for anything. And uh, unfortunately, I, n I never did see him again. We spoke and then I got the news at one point. I think he was on his way to Egypt and he might have had a heart attack on the plane or something. Allah yarhamahu. And may Allah bless him with Jennifer for dose. But I just wanted to share that. I don't have any too many more detailed stories. And I really wish I could have sat with him and got his story years ago. Uh, we probably talked about it. And uh, yeah, what can you say? So I just wanted to share a few reflections about one of my beloved, one of those true blue brothers that you meet uh, in this dunya and you pass. And then you hope. That in the next life that you'll meet and that you'll meet uh, in Jannah to Fardos. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless our brother Ali Clark with Jannah to Fardos and forgive him of his sins and bless all of his family and his children wherever they may be with khair and thabat and goodness. Fi dunya wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.